Hello, and welcome back to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. I'm a psychiatrist practicing here in Massachusetts. And this is a show that's about everything related to mental wellness in the Black community. So if you'd like to participate throughout the show, you can give us a call at 617-238-7111. We're also going to be streaming live on Facebook, so you can follow the live stream on the Facebook page, heat981fm.com. So guys, today is part two of my two-part series on music therapy. And last week I had Dr. Adeniki Webb and Dr. Natasha Thomas speaking about music therapy and what, uh, what it is. This week I have Morgan Beckford. Uh, she's a chief programming officer from the Community Music Center of Boston. And she's gonna talk to you about how you can bring more music into your life through either music lessons or music therapy. So Morgan Beckford is originally from Memphis, Tennessee. She embraces her work as an arts administrator, a teaching artist, and a performer. And she's very excited to share her experiences with the greater Boston community, having sharpened her education and outreach, uh, programming and development skills with the Opera Memphis, the Opera Memphis Summer Conservatories, and the Memphis Music Initiative. And currently, she serves as the Chief Programming Officer at the Community Music Center of Boston. And with a background in classical voice and musical theater, she enjoys singing as well as cultivating a love of music in others. So welcome to the show, Morgan. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here today. So I'm so excited to have you on the show. I'm a, a big fan of music and the use of music for our mental well-being. I feel like music in all its forms is very therapeutic. Um, and so I'm interested to know, you know, what brought you to music? What led you to the field of music? Well, it's it's something that my parents always valued when I was growing up. Um, I started playing piano when I was really young. And um, my dad is an ear, nose, and throat doctor and was actually on the board of the opera company back in Memphis. So he would get tickets for mom and my brothers and I to go see shows. And I would sit and watch people sing and say, oh my goodness, dad, how could they sing so loud without a microphone? I want to do that. So I think that's where like the seeds were planted of me being really, really interested in it um and when I when I was choosing what career paths I wanted to look at in high school I was singing I was taking voice lessons I was doing theater and I wanted to always have that be a part of my life so I fell in love with music early but I wanted to take that love on through middle high school and then into college so that's where the love really started Wow. And so, you know, did you, I guess, throughout your journey, did you start from the beginning kind of saying, you know what, I, this is what I want to do. And, and then you just kind of like did music the whole way, or did you do other things on the path to where you are now? Yeah, I, um, so when I started, I, um, I was a part of a summer conservatory where I sang with other high school kids, the same one that I ended up being a director at later on. But um, what I knew in my heart and my mind, as I said, all my friends and I were all going to be famous and we're all going to end up at the Met together. We're all going to get contracts. We're all going to be famous. <laughs> and um, as I went on through my journey through undergrad and then my graduate program, I found so much love. I found so much happiness in seeing how music affected other people and seeing how it could brighten their day. Um, I loved being a part of a service fraternity where we went and did uh, concerts at nursing homes and we would do educational performances with our opera center through the school. And that gave me so much joy, even more joy than working on my own voice and performing. And I think when I was in graduate school, I was also, I had a graduate assistantship in planned giving and development with the university. So I was talking to people about what they were passionate about, why they wanted to give back or give money to the University of Maryland, which is where I went to grad school. And that really kind of took me on a path that was much different than the performance path that I had originally like envisioned myself on forever. Oh, wow. And you know, I, as I think about, um, music and and then and also just the the radio show that I have and I a lot of times I speak about representation and how important it is to have representation to have people that look like us doing things um and I wonder in your path is that something that 
you thought about as well as, you know, because when I think about opera, I don't immediately think about diversity. Um, and so, you know, what, tell me a little bit about just about some, you know, maybe things that you came across or thought about um, being a person of color and doing opera and teaching other people. Yeah, yeah. I um, When I was in high school, the first educational performance opportunity that I had was to do a like 30 minute show about Leontine Price. And I was an understudy for the young artist who was doing the performances. And the days that I got to stand in for her, we went to schools, public schools often, or charter schools in Memphis, where the students, it would be a whole group of students that looked like me, that were black like me. And um, just the fact that I could get up there and sing in different languages, sing loud, the same types of stuff that amazed me when I was a kid. And the kids would raise their hand and say, so you do this? Like, you can do this? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can do this. You can do this. Um, and uh, in, my, in my time working in Memphis, one of the opportunities that I had was to direct the Opera Memphis Summer Conservatory. So this was after I had gone through my undergrad and my grad degree program. I came back to Memphis and we had a group of students. Some were from the suburbs, um, much more kind of white areas of the city. Some students were from the public schools in Memphis. Some were from the charter school systems. And one of the beautiful things about music is even though these this music is in a different language, even though this music may have been written a long time ago, it's just storytelling. And in a lot of ways, it can be the great equalizer for these students of different backgrounds to come together and say, oh, I know what it's like when my boyfriend cheated on me. And Mozart wrote about it however many years ago, 250 years ago. So it's it's so cool to see how music can help build connections across different communities. And um, something I always shared with the students from whatever background they were from is, you know, this is, it's an art form. It's something that there are a lot of very particular things that teachers and coaches and directors will be looking for. But I don't ever want students to feel like that that material, they don't have a right to it, right? They have the same right as any other artist to look at that material and take it as their own. Like, and last, last story I'll tell about this. We had, um, we had two students, two bar or a baritone and a tender tenor doing a Mozart duet. And they staged it like they were um, the Fresh Prince and Cockroach. And they had like sweaters and they did all the kind of like handshakes and stuff. And just the joy that they brought into that performance experience, it was all them. It wasn't them trying to be like Mozart's contemporaries would have performed it. They just brought their own joy to it. And that it, it was one of my favorite scenes that summer. And everybody cheered, all the girls. Were like, Woo! It, was, it was great. It was great. And I imagine that audiences would love that kind of thing. You know, they love to see, you know, classics being kind of redone and people making it their own and seeing that creative twist. And there's always going to be controversy. There's always some some folks that are kind of like, don't mess with the classics. But I think the great majority of us love to see something different. And it just, I think it brings a new joy and a new appreciation and often new audiences to appreciate even the classics. They kind of say, oh, wait, let's, let's, let me learn about where this came from, you know? So, you know, so I wonder about, um, you know, you, you work with a community music school of Boston. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show was that I want people to know about the community music uh, center of, of, of Boston. I want people to know about this resource. Um, and so tell us about it. You know, what is, what is the community music center of Boston? Yeah. So, uh, CMCB as it's called community music center of Boston, the abbreviation of CMCB, uh, began in Boston as a settlement school in 1910. Well, actually it's two separate settlement schools in 1910 that incorporated in the 40s into one site. And the mission of the Community Music Center of Boston has always been to bring music to the community, to the community of Boston. Um, the way that it started, lots of folks, um, immigrants who were coming over from overseas, they came to America. And I believe the founders of the school said, you know, how can we show you what our culture is about. And of course, that culture really embraced Western European music um, because that was the music that you study, the music that uh, folks really highly regarded. And 
over time, um, of course, like the Community Music Center has lots of opportunities to engage in like fiddle music and um, styles that may not be a part of that like traditional classical culture. But um, that was like the main the main focus of the space. Um, another, I think one beautiful thing about our organization is that we've always looked to the community to say, how can we better serve Boston? So um, in speaking about music therapy in the 1950s after the Korean War, when soldiers were coming back, uh, CMCB had a program where they worked with soldiers who had shell shock. And although it wasn't necessarily called the music therapy department at the time, what they were doing was using music to engage those soldiers to navigate what they had seen and what they'd worked through and the trauma that they'd experienced. Um, another beautiful thing with CMCB is when Boston had its integration in the 70s, that was very, very, very difficult. I learned a lot about it moving from Memphis. Like I thought integration was rough there and then I came to Boston and learned about what that was like. Um, and CMCB was one of the first spaces to send music teachers into those newly integrated schools that had lost funding for music programs. So something that we have always, always been passionate about is making sure that everyone in Boston has an opportunity to engage in music to the level that they want to and to find help find a way for music to serve them in their journey and whatever they're working through. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think what a mission that is, because I think, you know, as you mentioned, I, I think about how sometimes people kind of categorize music and segregate it. And they think, well, this kind of music is for this person and that kind of music is for that person. And these musical instruments, you can use these ones over here, but these ones, you know, that's that's not really um, common for, for you to use and, you know, this sort of thing. And it, this seems like the kind of place where you can go and you can be free. You can feel free to learn what you want to learn um, and explore what you need to explore and use music however you need to. Would that be a, kind of a correct um, description of the center? Definitely. I think it's a great description. And as we are um, like continuing in our work, giving our faculty and our teachers the tools to work with different types of students um, is something that we're really passionate about. A lot of our professional development sessions that we've had over the past year have focused on um, navigating students who might be in, who might be feeling trauma from what we're all feeling in the pandemic. Um, so I would definitely say that's a correct assessment. Uh, the other thing about our space is we offer about a third of our budget um, or a third of our tuition that we get from our community music school, we put back into financial aid. So we are very, very passionate about, you know, if you're a student who wants to come and study bassoon, like we want to help you get a bassoon. We want to help you find the right teacher. Our bassoon teacher is wonderful. Um, and we don't want you to feel that, you know, if you want to engage in an instrument that might be more expensive or have more expensive upkeep, we want to give you the tools to fully explore that and not feel limited by what, um, just by what, what you feel financially you could do. We want to give you the chance to explore. Oh, and so, and guys, if you're just joining, you're listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. And today I am doing part two of a two part series on music, the use of music in our own mental wellness. And my guest today is uh, Morgan um, Beckford, who is the Chief Programming Officer at the Community Music Center of Boston. And we're talking about the fact that a third of the tuition gets put back into financial aid. So if you or you have a child who is interested in learning to play a particular musical instrument, and for you, the only drawback is, I don't think I can afford it, you really need to look into this because there may be a way to help you to afford it so that you, you or your child can learn to play whatever musical instrument um, you would be interested in and doing. Don't let it be a limitation. Um, and so, so your center offers private lessons. Um, and tell us a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, so we have private lessons in many different instruments. So of course, piano, violin, viola, cello, guitar, winds, 
voice, brass, lots of different percussion, lots of different styles of instruments. Um, currently, uh, to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, about a year ago, we made a shift to move all of our programming online. And then when the new school year started this uh, in fall 2020, we brought some of our instruments back on site. So we do have in-person instruction for piano, percussion, and all of the strings. For this school year, uh, those students who are studying winds, brass, or voice, we do have that programming available online, but just due to current restrictions and safety concerns, we kept those offline for the school year. Um, currently, I believe about 70% of our students are engaging with us online and 30% are coming into the space. So for private lessons, um, we have 30 minute lessons, we have 45 minute lessons and 60 minute. And um, there is a rental fee for instruments. We have an instrument library that we can rent out to students. And um, if, if folks need financial aid or support with instrument rentals, that's something that they can apply for in our financial aid process. And um, we don't, as far, I, I believe, except maybe for harps, I believe that all of our rental fees are consistent no matter what instrument you are engaging in. Um, we also uh, do take instrument donations. So oftentimes we'll get folks that want to donate a keyboard or a piano. And we have a running list of students who are waiting, um, who are engaging in keyboard instruction to donate pianos or keyboards to them. And those we do some oftentimes without renting them out at all. We just donate them. Oh, wow. And so um, currently, it, it, with the pandemic, there's a, quite a bit of online instruction. And what is going to be the vision for that, kind of looking at maybe the next academic year? Do you foresee that there's going to be some people that will just continue to be online? Or do you hope to shift completely back to in-person? We, we definitely view um, online instruction as a way to navigate some of the barriers in the city that make it difficult for folks to get to the South End. We are located in the South End, by the way, in the basement of the BCA. Um, so we fully intend on keeping online instruction as a programming vehicle into the future, into next year and beyond. Um, our, our CEO and our COO kind of have a running bet on what they think the cocktail will be of what's the in-person versus online percentage that we'll be looking at next year. Um, and we, we, the way that we're setting up our um, process is we want to be able to adapt to our community and meet folks where they are in their own risk assessment of what they're comfortable engaging in. Um, we, we have a, a, a group called the Reentry Working Group that's made up of staff members, uh, board and corporation members, faculty members, and um, other individuals who we talk about these ideas with and say, you know, this is the data and the feedback that we're getting from our community. What are the concerns that these different constituencies have so that as we pivot our COVID-19 policies, we're keeping our community at the heart of the discussion? Also, a lot of a lot of thought going into it. Um, and uh, now I, I, I wonder about folks that may be interested in, in group kinds of things like choirs or other maybe group lessons. Um, is that offered as well? We do offer those. Uh, currently in our early childhood program, which we serve uh, students five months to 80 plus years. So we've got the whole spectrum. Uh, in, our, our, in our early childhood program, we do have beginning instruments uh, that are group classes for students to um, do a semester of different string instruments. We have a couple of semesters of beginning piano. We have an introduction to winds and brass class, like an instrument exploration sort of thing. Um, we do have adult group classes as well. We have our adult choir, Una Voce, that does lots of really, really fun stuff. Recently, they did um, 
for the most recent ensembles virtual concert, they did a like a production of Happy by Pharrell. And they all danced out in their like communities. It was so cool to see where everybody was sending in their videos. Um, we also have an adult ukulele choir. Oh, we have, yeah, which is really fun. <laughs> we have um, a couple of uh, quartets and chamber groups that engage adults. Um, something that I always say is like, if you and three friends wanted to come to CMCB and say, hey, we want to work on some repertoire, uh, we will find a teacher to help work with you. Very cool. Very cool. So, so listeners, if you're out there, you're not too old. You're not too old to learn to play a musical instrument. It's not too late. Or if there's something you played in your childhood and you want to pick it up again, like I, I used to play the piano and I keep thinking, oh, at some point I'm going to pick this up again, or maybe I'll learn how to play the guitar. This would be, this would be a good opportunity. And even if I'm not able to make it out to the South End, I could do a, maybe a mixture of like online and some in-person at times and that kind of thing. So I like that flexibility. And I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention, we do have a chamber orchestra. Uh, so for folks that if you played maybe in orchestra in high school, or if you um, might have played with a symphonic group, or uh, we do have a winds ensemble group also. But if you just want to play with a group of people, we, we have that too. Currently, the chamber orchestra is happening online. Um, we're still in talks about what that'll look like for twenty, the the next year, 2021-22 school year. Now, now what I want to know, and I'm sure some folks might want to know too, is, is this, this is the kind of thing where you need to have like a talent for this, or could anybody do it regardless of talent? Like, is this for fun, or is this kind of for people that are serious about music? It depends on the ensemble, for sure. I, I would say a chamber orchestra it is an audition group. So um, there are, it's mostly of the student age folks, it's mostly high schoolers in that group. And there are some adults also. Um, but the ukulele choir, una voce, there's no audition required. You can just okay. come in. And then for um, the private lessons, of course, private lessons, you can start from very, very beginner, if you want to come back as a um, as somebody who played for a while, we have an adult student who did play in college, and now they're far off in their other career, but they come back and say, you know, like, these are skills that I miss being able to focus on and brush up on. So whatever kind of where you are in your musical journey, we have stuff here for you. Wow. Wow. And so... Um... How do you guys usually advertise? Because um, I know this is, I, I, before I was kind of looking up music therapy, I hadn't really heard of you. And, and so, you know, where do you tend to advertise? How do people hear about you? We have been, I, I would say I will give my answer, but our chief advancement officer, I'm sure will have a much <laughs> more comprehensive answer. But um, for a long time, we were a school that focused on the South End. Um, that's the neighborhood where we were. We were putting up flyers. We are very word of mouth and community oriented. Um, and now as we are looking towards our future and we, we just engaged in a strategic planning process with TDC that was really, really wonderful. And it's a five year plan. Um, we don't wanna be the best kept secret in Boston anymore. Uh, one of the things that we've done now is we have a new website that has been um, that has been launched and designed that we've seen a lot more traffic on. I think the way that that website works is maybe more useful for getting the word out about us. Um, but for the community music school, we folks tell their friends like, Hey, little Susie's in this class, little Johnny should come too." um, for our music therapy programs, we work with a number of hospitals, uh, a number of community centers and some schools in different areas. Um, and for our school programs, we work in, in, in a non-COVID year, we might work with about 3,000 students in classrooms in the Boston Public Schools. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about is making sure that those communities are aware of the ecosystem, the arts ecosystem that they're a part of by having a 
CMC be teaching artists in their space. And um, like one of the things that we are doing this year is engaging in a large scale like translation effort for a lot of our materials. So when we go to that school in East Boston, we can say, okay, we recognize you need uh, materials in Spanish and in Creole and in Vietnamese. So how can we get these communities that we really, really value how can we make sure that they know that when they receive materials from us, when they walk into our space, that our community is for them too. So, so going into schools, um, reaching out a bit more uh, versus uh, kind of just being in one geographical area, kind of reaching out to multiple kind of further places. So. Yeah. Yeah. Reaching out and also, um, really engaging with those communities to say how, what are the ways that we can serve your community particularly beyond the coming into the classroom and doing the really awesome performances that the students do at these spaces. How can we invest ourselves in your community further beyond the winter and spring concert? Wow. And so, I, you know, I think I, I should have asked you this a little bit earlier, but your role as chief programming officer, tell tell me a little bit more about what your role is and yeah, about what you do. Yeah, yeah. So um, we are an organization that serves many. So we have different programming departments that I can talk about a bit. Uh, we have our community music school, which is our programming that takes place at our location at 34 Warren under the BCA and the B and the basement of the BCA. Um, they that also includes our online programming that students would register through our front office for. Um, then on the other side, we have our community engagement programs, which include all of the programming that takes place in partnership with a site like a community center or a hospital or an adult health uh, day health program. Um, and there are two different senior directors who manage all of the programming. And I work with the community or with both of the senior directors to ensure that the vision of the organization is reflected in both sides of the organization. Um, when I first came to CMCB, all between the community music school and the community engagement programs, the it was more like we had five different programming facets so it used to be the early childhood programs the uh like the school like the 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 community music school itself with like private lessons groups and ensembles then we had our school outreach programs which are the um programs where we were engaging with students during the school day we had our satellite programs, which is programs where we're engaging, engaging with students after school. And then our music therapy programs, which is where the trained music therapists would be engaging with group or private instruction, depending on the student. Um, essentially, we went through a reorg this past fall where I kind of shook everything up and said, okay, stuff that happens inside, stuff that happens at, outside. Um, we found that there were lots of different challenges that the different directors were navigating and all of the challenges that the community engagement program faculty were navigating were all really similar from like school outreach satellite music therapy and all the challenges that the community music school folks the early childhood and private groups ensembles were they were they were all looking similar so that's kind of why we did the reorg we the way we did but long story short my goal is to ensure that the programs are working towards our mission and vision in the way that makes the most sense as we're working with these very diverse constituencies and very, very different programming styles. Oh, wow. Okay. And how long have you been working with them again? I've been there. This is my third year, third year. The pandemic year is a little funky. <laughs> the, the pandemic <laughs> is so, it's so difficult. It's in a year that's very difficult to account for. Uh, I find myself sometimes saying last year when I actually mean 2019, because like 2020 is like just this like kind of weird stretch of time. Um, <laughs> so, so you mentioned that, you know, that for music, for private music instruction, um, 
the age range is basically all ages. And this is also for music instruction, but then also for music therapy as well, all age ranges. Yes, all age ranges. Um, and then the, what about the demographics? You know, is, um, do you find a lot of folks of color engaging in this program and this center? We do, we do. Um, in our demographics, uh, I'm, I'm aggregating all of our community work and all of our community music school work. So all in all, I believe we are, major I mean, we are a majority minority. Um, we have about a 20 to 25 percent of our community uh, describes itself as Asian or Asian American. Um, we have about eight to 10% uh, African-American black, about 12 to 15% Latinx, and then about 40 to 45% of our remaining population would be white. So our when we talk about a diverse community, we truly, truly are a diverse community with students coming to our community music school from everywhere from like Concord, New Hampshire and Weston to um, like, from Roxbury, Dorchester, Hyde Park, Brockton, Randolph. We have students coming from everywhere. Wow. So that's that's pretty cool that it's kind of from all over. There's not really this limitation now of, of, uh, geog of I guess, geography. Um, yeah, yeah, we do have some parents that are, are really happy, too, that we are offering online programming and that they don't have to drive to the community <laughs> music center on Saturday morning. So... <laughs> Definitely a good reason to keep online instruction available. And do you do a, a large number of folks engage in the instrument rental? Do a lot of people take make um, kind of utilize that that particular benefit, the instrument rental? They do. They do. Um, especially for students, if you're on your journey and saying, you know, I'm out of beginning instruments. Like I've taken my group violin class. I really want to try violin, but maybe I want to do viola, maybe I want to do cello. Um, our rental prices are structured so that it's an affordable option as students are deciding, you know, do I want to continue further in this journey? Um, as and folks who engage in instrumental instruction, I'm a vocalist, so I didn't have this challenge as much necessarily, but um, folks know that if students do want to continue um, into college music, oftentimes they'll need to upgrade their instrument to one that'll give them more tools or um, will be able to help their sound sound better, or their technique shine a little bit better. Um, and we have some of those instruments also for rental, um, but we don't charge more to rent those. Well, and I'm, I'm also just curious to know about the kind of the range of like musical instruments, um, just because I, I guess I enjoy hearing about, um, I guess, musical instruments that are not as commonly known or even just some of our kids may not even think that they could aspire to learn how to play. So tell us a little bit more about the range of instruments, um, just so people can kind of think about like, oh, I, maybe I would be interested in learning that. Yeah, we have, um, of course, I talked about the piano, the percussion, all of those. Um, one of our percussion instructors, the chair of our department, is does a lot of work with African drumming. So if you're interested in that activity, he has some drums at the studio, and I'm sure that he would be really, really happy to work with folks in that. Um, we have harp as an instrument uh, that we are uh, one of our, our harp teacher works with a gentleman, uh, a gentleman who builds harps for younger students that can convert oh. from like a harp like a like a harp that is like floor size for them but they it comes on a stand that can you can take off and it can turn into a lap harp as they get oh. older and want to continue working um we have oh my goodness bassoons we have a um uh, on our YouTube page, on CMCB's YouTube page, we have, uh, I believe, some footage of our bassoon choir. Uh, <laughs> our bassoon instructor gets her whole studio, and they did a version of Poker Face last year that was pretty awesome. Um, we also have things like uh, dulcimer and tin whistle. Uh, one of our uh, adult students is part of our performathon, which is our essentially marathon recital 
in person, what we used to do is take a whole Saturday from like nine to five and have a recital going all day to help fundraise and had a fundraiser attached to it. Um, but this year we took it virtual and one of our adult students is a tin whistle student and he played My Heart Will Go On against a mountain in the sunset, you know. And um, so for real, lots of different instruments <laughs> folks can engage in. Um, in our school programs too, we uh, do often have students do recorder. If you went through elementary school music, you probably, <laughs> you're, you or your parents probably remember the, re the recorder unit. And um, we definitely extend that opportunity to our uh, students as well. Oh, yeah, the recorder was a big deal. <laughs> we were a little like, wait, that person got to play the recorder. I didn't get to play the recorder. What's going on here? You know, it's kind of, it was a big deal. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, for folks that are just joining, you're listening to Black Mental Health Matters. I'm Dr. Carrie Ann Williams. And Today, we're talking about music uh, and how music can help to enhance us in our mental wellness. I'm here with Morgan Beckford from the Community Music Center of Boston, and we're talking about how to um, put more music in your life, whether that's learning how to play an instrument or being a part of a, a group singing um, or even doing music therapy. And last week, um, I had... Um, Dr. Edeniki Webb and Dr. Natasha Thomas talked to us about what is music therapy. And so today I want you guys to learn about the Community Music Center of Boston, which is a resource that we have right here in Massachusetts. Um, and they offer online instruction um, as well as in-person instruction. Um, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that there's financial aid um, that there, that that's, you know, a possibility for folks um, in terms of paying for, um, for, services for lessons. I, I wonder if folks might want to know a little bit about just how expensive it is in general. Does it depend on the instrument? Does it like, what's kind of the average out of pocket maybe cost for maybe a family that has the means, how much might they be paying for this? Yeah. So our uh, 30 minute lessons, both our lessons and music therapy sessions start at about 55, 75 an hour. Um, that being said, uh, I do not know the exact percentage of our students that are on financial aid this year, um, but I do know that um, depending on you know what your monthly take home is, our financial aid process takes a lot of things into account, and um, we want to ensure you do have an opportunity on that form to say, you know, this is what I am able to pay. This is what I can afford for lessons. Or where can you meet us for that? Um, the instrument rentals, I believe, are about $60 a semester, but they are prorated. Um, and for enrollment, we have enrolling enrollment throughout the year. So if you wanted to engage in lessons starting now even, you could still enter our financial aid pool. We would still be able to support you if you needed it. Um, lessons get more expensive for third, for 45 minutes and for 60. Um, and then our group classes currently this year are at, are priced at 650 for the year. So that would be from September to June, about 32 weeks of, um, whatever group class, whether it's small group, large group that you're engaging in. That's about where prices sit right now and those are prorated as well. So if folks wanted to come join Ukulele Choir now, no, you wouldn't have to pay $600 for the last three months of the year. <laughs> I almost want to join this Ukulele Choir just out of curiosity. <laughs> it's really great. The, the instructor and not to all like all of our faculty are wonderful. So, but um, I actually took lessons with our ukulele instructor because the the time didn't work for me for the choir but i took private lessons with him a couple summers ago and had a lot of fun it's <laughs> wonderful it sounds like a lot of fun um so now for the for the um music therapy is there also financial aid for that as well or is it just for instructions for music instruction yes we do offer financial aid for music therapy and um the financial aid committee, as part of their process, um, looks at what programming folks are considering, and we definitely recognize that some of our some individuals who are interested in music therapy may have other expenses that are um, 
that that may make kind of that that may i guess may indicate that they might need a little bit more support and that is something that the fa committee does talk about okay um and so is this uh in terms of folks that may be interested in like donating or contributing what is the process for them do they have to talk you go to the website or you know talk to a particular contact to kind of you know or you know what is the process for helping uh, the school or donating things yes yes um so i mean we will take money all the time <laughs> uh, our website is www.cmcb.org um, and there are i believe there's some information that you can find pretty easily about instrument donations or how to support us um, one of the things we have coming up is our spring performathon. So that marathon recital that we did in the fall, we're bringing it back for the spring. Um, students have an opportunity to submit their video for the performathon event, and they can also ask for that video to be evaluated by the faculty in their department if they want to get a sense of, you know, how am I doing compared to other students, how I did last year. Um, some of the students are really, really are very goal oriented so that meets their need um and as part of the performathon event we are having like a second part of our fundraiser and um i believe that on the performathon page as students create their own fundraising websites you can actually go and choose a student learn their story and choose to donate in their name or in support of them um this past fall when we did the fall performathon the performathon prize that we gave out for fundraisers was a usb microphone to help them in their studies so that they sound better I, like that's something that i honestly need to sign up for lessons for again and perform a performathon next year because i want my own mic right <laughs> um but uh that's something that um we wanted to ensure that as folks were supporting the organization, that students could be recognized in that and their important role in it. Because they're, they're the ones, I think, who really, really show us how important all of this is. So you can always donate for Performathon, you can donate generally. Um, with instrument donations, that process will look like um, if, you, if you're interested in donating an instrument, um, our advancement team will connect you with a gentleman named Michael Wark, who will talk to you about what, um, what instrument you wanna donate, what need is there in the school for that instrument, and then they'll, he'll take the next steps from there. Awesome, awesome. And, and there's also programming through the summer, or is it just um, through the academic year? There's programming through the summer. Uh, in non-COVID years, uh, we have run two pretty comprehensive programs called Summer Arts and Summer Music uh, that were four-week programs. I'm remembering because last year it was three weeks. This la It's usually four weeks. This summer we're putting those programs on hold, but we have a more um, kind of diverse offering, list of offerings for group classes over the summer, um, as well as private instruction. We've expanded the hours and availability for one-on-one -on -one lessons for the remainder of the summer. Um, I believe adult ukulele choir will continue into the summer. I think that's in the mix, so it is not too late. Um, <laughs> And then uh, we'll also have some musical theater classes, a jazz and country guitar accompaniment class for elementary school age students. Um, lots of different things that we'll be offering this summer. Awesome. Now let's talk a little bit about music therapy. Um, I, I just wanted to know about how kind of how that side goes and um, you know the music therapists, how they, uh, I guess, how that's set up, where are they kind of where the service is available? Um, is, it, is it also on site? Is it also online? Does it also go to the schools? Tell us a little bit about the reach of the music therapy programs and how that works. For sure. So um, music therapy is all online for this school year, this academic year. Um, one of the reasons that we made that decision is um, many of our music therapy individuals who participate one-on-one -on, -one on site are a part of vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Um, but we have our one-on-one -on -one music therapy sessions, which um, 
again, if you're only interested in in-person music therapy sessions, definitely check back with us in the fall. Because again, our policies will be changing as we're entering this new age of vaccination and COVID looking a little different. Um, but for our in our one-on-one -on -one music therapy sessions, you can register for those through our front office. Um, we work with young students, we work with high school students, we work with adults, we work with seniors, we work with a whole kind of array of populations of folks. Um, and then for our site work, we have music therapy programs that take place virtually with hospitals, schools, and adult day health programs. Um, one thing that we do that I think is really, really cool that I credit our um, community engagement manager or community uh, senior director of the community music school, who's formerly our director of music therapy with, is we have um, two programs that are hybrid music therapy and music instruction programs in Boston public schools. Oh. So in these sites, uh, one's a dance program that's uh, dance and music therapy hybrid. Another is a songwriting and music therapy hybrid. So with two instructors in that space, I think in one, the it might be that like in one space, both instructors work with a group of students in another space they alternate and switch off on different days but um something that i really really love about that approach is the fact that students can get all the things that they need in their music instruction and also get some of the tools and coping mechanisms to navigate some of the anxi anxiety anger trauma that they're feeling as being students right now which is real um we do also have music therapy, like solely music therapy programs that we engage in schools with, um, like in autism strand classrooms and um, things like that. So music therapy in our, our regular kind of non-COVID year looks like about 500 individuals served in our community programs and somewhere between like 10 to 20, depending on how many folks we get on site, but we're always looking for more. Wow, I think that's just amazing. I like the kind of the hybrid, the combination. I mean, I, I you know, I think about music and the arts in general and how it it helps us with our overall emotional wellness in a way that, you know, talk therapy is great, medications can be helpful and, and those things are great, but there's something about touching us uh, as, as humans in a, in a, in a way that we can't talk about, the way that we can't speak, you know, dance, drumming, um, songwriting, all of that is uh, the expression of emotion and of thoughts, really, that are so difficult to kind of organize in other ways, but can be organized in that way. And, you know, one of the things that um, they spoke about last week, a music therapist said, is that even folks who have um, what they call Broca's aphasia, they can't speak, they can still sing. And it, it reminded me, I had learned that back in neurology and I had totally forgot. And when she said it, it reminded me of that. And I thought, you know, music really does touch us in a way that is different from all, all, all other things. Um, even just the, the rhythmicity, um, because, you know, we have waves, you have brain waves. Um, and, yeah. and this kind of thing can be in sync as well. And so music is, is just a fantastic medium. I, I've always had an appreciation for it, even though I've never been really great at, at, at playing the piano. Um, you know, I've always had an appreciation for people that have a talent for music. Um, I wanted to, to ask you about what you enjoy the most about the work that you do. Um, what do you find the most rewarding? Things like that. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I, one of my answers would be, and I'll, I'll think of another better answer, but um, something that I, I really miss about work being online is being in a school full of students and walking down the hallway and hearing Mozart and Alicia Keys and ukulele choir and harpsichord and just all these different sorts of instruments as you walk through the space. Um, Cause it's such a really, really awesome way of folks coming together. Um, something I find really, really rewarding in this period of time about this work is just the fact that 
so many folks say, you know, I'm so glad I have my music lessons. I'm so glad I have my music programming because in all of the school systems changing and in person to hybrid to five days a week coming up for BPS, um, one of the things that they say is, you know, my music lesson takes place at the same time every week. It's something that I can count on. It's something that I know is coming and it's a part of my life that hasn't changed as much as I thought it would in the pandemic. Um, the other thing that I'll say is my my team. My team is absolutely wonderful that I have the opportunity to work with that the the staff at CMCB as well as the faculty. Um, it's a space where everyone cares a lot, and I, I don't think like we don't have teachers who are just like phoning in for the check. Like they are very very passionate about their students and making sure that their students have what they need, and. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be at a place like that, in a space like that. Um, something that Lacolian Washington, our executive director, always says is, you know, like, I try to surround myself with people smarter than me who know more than me, because in all of that will be better. And I feel that same way about our faculty. Like, we have amazing, amazing teachers on staff. Wow. Wow. And so what would you say to anyone listening that may be interested in following in your footsteps? Maybe they also have a love for music. Maybe they've had some kind of background, but they've thought, oh, I don't know if I, if this is something I should pursue. What would you say to someone like that? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, music is in so many ways, it's the language of emotion, right? And I think studying music, engaging in music helped, it, it's helped me find myself and helped me find my purpose. Like I, I really feel in a lot of ways, what I do is feels a lot like service, right? Like I'm trying to help other folks be the better selves that they want to be or help connect more deeply and all that sort of thing. And you know, I, I love performing. I love getting up and singing on a stage. It makes me really happy. But just the fulfillment that I get from helping somebody else make a musical connection, it's it, it means a lot. And being in a space where, you know, we have a lot of teachers, we have a lot of staff, we have a lot of people that are passionate. Um, I, I love getting to be the person to come and talk to folks like you. I love being the person to go and talk to donors about like, hey, if you wanna know why the student needs the saxophone, let me tell you all about them and why it's gonna change their life. Um, so I, I would say, you know, keep sticking with the music, but also see, you know, how does it serve you? And how can that, the other gifts you have along with music, how can that help serve others? Oh, I want to thank you so much. Yeah, very grateful for you. And I am grateful for the work that the Community Music Center of Boston is doing. Um, and so folks can go to the website. That's www.cmcb.org. Community CMC. Music Center of Boston, cmcb.org. cmcb.org. Um, you guys can get more information online um, and you can connect with folks there through the website. Um, and uh, you know, so thanks again for coming on and everyone, thanks for listening. Um, you've been listening to Black Mental Health Matters. We've been talking about music therapy and music instruction today. Um, and so you can join me again next week. I'll have another great guest on. It'll be Sunday at 1 p.m. on 98.1 FM, The Urban Heat. So I will talk with you then. Thanks for joining. <laughs>